Yes, I'm an oncologist at Northwestern, but I'm here on behalf of a nonprofit organization that uh, Randy Bellasomo and I have started. It's, in, uh, it's called Life Matters Media. I included our brochure there for you. Um, it tells you about our services, what we do. I'm going to tell you a little bit about us, and then we'll jump into the program. Randy, unfortunately, can't be here today. Um, this is Randy. She's a reporter at WGN. And I'm going to tell her story a little bit, but usually she tells her story. Um, so, she, yes, she's a reporter at WGN, and uh, when she was in her late 20s, her husband was diagnosed with metastatic colon cancer. So, as quite a young person, she dealt with um, her husband having metastatic colon cancer and ultimately dying of that. I was his doctor. And that's what brought us together. We started talking about. Um, what he went through in their experience, what he went through and what she went through, and what their experience was, and what could have been better, what could have been done better. And she felt that the big thing that was lacking was discussion about um, the ultimate uh, end of life, about what would happen, what happened for him, and could that have been managed better. And we talked a lot about um, how we could make that better, and uh, it comes down to conversation. So we started this program called Starting the Conversation, um, and it's about how, talking about uh, end of life, what occurs in the end of life, how you can prepare for it, um, and just make, helping people to become more comfortable with end of life discussions, because that's, uh, that's what's lacking, is comfort with the discussion. And we've seen that in so many things in culture in the past. You start talking about it, it shows up in the media, that's where the media part of our name comes from. Um, you start reading stories, more and more stories about it, and, uh, and people get more comfortable with it, and it can be part of the general conversation, and not such a taboo subject. And for anybody dealing with cancer, I'm an oncologist at Northwestern, so um, I help a lot of people through their cancer treatments, and ultimately, um, many of my patients die of their cancer. So trying to improve the conversation for physicians, and for how we connect with our patients, and having, helping them to have the conversation, was all something that we thought was lacking the medical care and was pretty important. So that's what we um, set out to do. So that's so Randy's also a reporter at WGN, if she looks familiar. So there she is with a microphone, and there she is at Cancer Wellness Center a couple of years ago giving this presentation. So, um, so that's what we do. So we came together um, to form Life Matters Media. And this is our goal, is to be the premier provider for information, resources, and support for everybody involved in end-of-life decision-making. Helping people to get to get that power themselves to make these decisions that are so important. Um, knowing what your options are ahead of time, what sorts of problems may come up, and how you can prepare for it. So we have a whole series of community programs, and what we've done is combined the first two, starting the conversation. So how do you have this conversation? And instead of talking about end of life, we feel it's more beneficial to identify what your goals and values are. Think about how you want to live your life rather than just focusing on the end of life. And then in addition, how do we make this happen? We call it securing your care preferences, and that um, deals with the advanced directives, which is such an important part. And oftentimes, that's all people know about this process, but um, there's a lot more that goes on before you fill out the form. We have a couple of other programs which we'll also be doing here. One is called Caring Options. We'll talk about palliative care, what that means, hospice care. Um, pros and cons, when, when is the appropriate time, and then final matters, organ donation, medical donation, um, and other options for disposition. And uh, there's, that's usually one that people kind of shy away from, but the conversation is always interesting. So we welcome you to, to come back and join us for this. So we're going to start with um, starting the conversation. And what is this conversation? This conversation is a conversation about your values and goals, and this is a process. It's not a one-time conversation. What we focus on is for people to evaluate their own goals and values. What's important to you? What, is, what are things that, that make your life meaningful? And what are your goals during your, the remainder of your life? Then you need to educate yourself about what issues might come up, what sorts of things may come up towards the end of life um, that you may have to deal with, that, that questions that physicians will ask you decisions that need to be made, and preparing for some of those. Discussing these wishes with your loved ones and your medical team. Once you establish what, what your values and goals are, 
you then have to share it with people because just in case you are not in a position to be able to share that with the medical providers who are helping you to make decisions at the time. And then the last step, as I said, is documenting those wishes in these advanced directives. So there's a lot that goes on before that. Why do we do this? Why do we think this is important? Um, there's a lot of data in this area that's shown that, um, that there's less physical and psychological stress at the end of life if people talk about what's important to them and what they would want. As somebody gets, um, as people age, as, they get, as a disease progresses, uh, there's a lot of decisions that need to come up, that, that need to be made. And if you have thought about some of these things ahead of time, it's much less stressful. If people um, discuss this with their loved ones ahead of time when, they're, when it's not in a crisis situation, when it's, not, um, you know, when it's not in that emergency situation, people can make much more clear decisions based on their true values and goals. It gives people the time to prepare for these things, prepare mentally, um, emotionally, uh, even to prepare to get, you know, you've all heard this term, get your affairs in order, right? That's real. People do need to get their affairs in order, uh, but that's such a cliche, people look at me like, what does that mean? You know, what affairs? Uh, this can support the concerns of people with a chronic or a terminal illness. By having this conversation, you are staying involved. You stay involved in your healthcare choices. You're not, you know, deferring that to somebody else to make those decisions for you. You're able to stay involved and to let your loved ones know what's important to you. Um, it improves communication with the healthcare team. Right? That's one of the biggest complaints we get at the hospital. You know, when something does not go well, it usually doesn't go well because of a lack of communication. Um, if people are clear on what their wishes are and they're able to communicate it, articulate it, put it into words, you can't do that in a crisis moment, but you can do that ahead of time and think about it. Um, shared decision making. So many people approach these decisions with their family. Their, their children, their spouse, their best friend, whoever it is that's at their bedside, these decisions, um, having somebody who's dissenting at the bedside can be very stressful. But if everybody has discussed this ahead of time and they're all there to support the person who's ill or who's dying, it's, it's a much more um, congenial situation for everybody involved. And it helps you to maintain control at every stage of your health. You know, we're all a bunch of control freaks. We all want to make our decisions and control the situation as much as we can. And if somebody has an illness that's progressing, especially something like cancer, a lot of that's out of our control. You know, we try to control what we can. When I give chemotherapy, it's to try and change the course of an illness. But I know that a lot of these things are out of my control. Can I interrupt for a second? Will you have these as a handout? Or should we be writing um, everything? I can certainly provide this to you. I do have this handout. Really. No, no. So I can send you this ahead. I can send you this. I'm sorry. I, I wasn't sure if they would have the slides. But I can go ahead and forward them on to you. I'll actually step out of the camera here a second. I can. I do have. A, if you want to give me your contact information, okay. I can send you the slides. That'll be great. Feel free to fill in your email address, and I can forward them to you. I'd be happy to. Um, oh, the last thing that that this has benefited. There's something called um, complicated grief. And complicated grief is when people, everybody grieves. Grieving is normal, it's a normal process, and it's necessary. You grieve for the person you've lost. But complicated grief is when those people who are left are unable to move on with their life. And I've seen this. I've gotten calls a year later from family members, five years later, and they're still struggling with um, what happened the last few hours or the last few days of a person's life and they're not able to move on. They're not, it's interfering with their job, with their relationships, with their families. And that's complicated grief. And it's something that can be avoided if everybody's secure in the decisions that are made and nobody's having to guess what's the right thing to do for the loved one. So these are all, um, many of the benefits of having these conversations ahead of time. So here's where I co-opt Randy's story. This is Randy and her husband, Carlos. And um, Carlos is my patient. He was diagnosed with colon cancer. Um, this is their engagement. She's shown off her beautiful ring there. And, um, you know, she was 26 years old or something. You know, uh, getting ready for the rest of her life, had a different plan in mind. And uh, a couple of years into their marriage, Carlos was diagnosed with stage 4 colon cancer. He underwent treatment. He had a lot of chemotherapy. He underwent surgery. He, um, like, 
underwent second surgery. It was a very long and involved um, treatment plan. And he had good days and bad days, as most people do. Um, they, were, uh, they were both journalists. Randy works at WGN, Carlos, at, they met doing journalism. Carlos at the time, I think was at CLTV. So they were both working there. And here they are in their journalism jobs, talking to people, asking questions. And um, they were talkers. They, they were curious people, both of them. And, uh, and Randy discovered that they weren't talking to each other about this. You know, they could talk to other people, but they weren't having these conversations, these hard conversations with each other about, about how Carlos was going to die and what was going to happen then. What sorts of things were important to him? What were his values? What were his goals? And they didn't address it that way, which is what um, brought us to this organization. Um, and it was about a year and a half, more, just more, less than two years into his illness, um, Carlos was getting sicker, and he, got one early one morning, um, he suffered a pulmonary embolism. And he, they were talking to each other, they were making plans for the day, she was getting ready to go out to work, and, uh, and he dropped, and couldn't breathe, couldn't get his breath. 911 was called, ambulance comes, screaming, screeching, um, very traumatic event that um, I know she still feels. And uh, he had this pulmonary embolism and he was brought to Northwestern Hospital. And it was about, and it was later that day, they contacted family that was both in New York and California to fly in. And later that night they extubated him and he died. And they never had to have these conversations. And she always regretted the fact that they didn't talk about the things that really mattered to him. Did he do everything he wanted to? Um, he had, he got the last rites, which was important to him. But there were other things that um, he had a niece that had been born just recently he never got to see and, and things that he would have wanted to say. So she always felt that um, because of, they did not have this conversation that he was denied those things. So this is what brought us to our organization. Unfortunately, um, Randy is not here today because she is with her family um, in Memphis. Her father was diagnosed with a brain tumor. So she's going through this again now in a little different way. And really, she's there with her mother, um, helping shepherd this whole um, situation there in Memphis. And that's why she's not here with us today. So uh, she has learned a lot from this, but it never makes it easy. So what are we talking about here? What this conversation? Um, she claims that what they failed to do was to make a quality of care plan. And she actually did a much better job at this than she gives herself credit for. During, during Carlos's illness. The quality of care plan um, has three main steps. One is to accept the morality of our mortality. We have to really accept the fact that we're gonna die someday. And you know, we can all sit here and say, yeah, yeah, yeah. But then when, as it gets closer, it, it's harder to accept. So understanding that, um, that we are all gonna die is the first step of this. Once, that's, once we make that, that we accept that uh, reality, then we need to discuss what our goals are, what are our goals of care. And what do we want? You know, what, what is important to us? What do we want? What are our values? What do we want to achieve in the time we have? And then most importantly, that this conversation is to be infused with our own beliefs and values. Anybody who's been in and out of the hospital, it's a big, you know, any hospital is a big organization. And there's people coming and going, and people often get talked at instead of talked with, spoken to. So, and people aren't always exploring your beliefs and your values. Right? They're, they're not asking that. And that's such an important part of what makes us who we are, and what makes this precious time in our life um, valuable, is to really infuse our own beliefs and our own values into the decisions that we make. And that doesn't always happen in so, Randy and I ended up working out at the same gym. And one day, uh, one day, many days, we'd be on the treadmill next to each other, and she asked questions. And this was after Carlos died. She would ask me very blue questions and very specific. Do you remember that day in the hospital when that resident said this and this and this? And this was all stuck in her mind. She remembers the, the entire episode, everything. And she said to me one day, why didn't you tell me Carlos was dying? 
And I'm on the treadmill, and I'm thinking, I, I did. You know, we talked about that. We did. And she said, no, you actually didn't. What you said is that Carlos is going to die. And I looked at her like, what? It's the same thing. And she told me, no, it's very different. So everybody's going to die. That's very, that's very esoteric. Yes, we're all going to die. But the fact that he is dying is very different. And she said that's a different word. It has different meaning, different connotation. And it would have meant something different. She would have felt the urgency of it. And I, I thought about this. And it took me a while to kind of really make this distinction in my head. And actually, it was a week or so after this conversation, I was um, dealing. I was helping a family whose um, elderly mother and grandmother was dying, and she was in the hospital. She was in the hospital bed, and there was this whole beautiful family around her. And I would go to visit her in the hospital. I go into the room, and they would all start peppering me with questions. You know, what's the blood test show? What did the chest X-ray show? What is this? All these different pieces and parts. Meanwhile, the, this woman was dying, and it was a hard thing to say. But I told them. I said, "Your mother's dying," and that word, adding that ing, made a big difference. All of a sudden, the whole mood in the room changed, and they realized, oh, all this other stuff kind of doesn't matter. And they rallied around her, and the conversation changed. And it really, it taught me that it really does make a difference. And you can't use euphemisms, and you can't dance around the issue. You have to really have these conversations, and they're not easy. It wasn't easy for me as a doctor, and it's not easy for a patient to have to hear, and I understand that. But once this is broken, once you let that, once you address the elephant in the room, um, the conversation can change and it can be very different. And the whole relationship and the plan going forward can be very different. Now you're focusing on somebody is dying. How do we make this as as the, this time as valuable and as comfortable as possible? So, who here has thought about the medical care that you want at the end of life? Let me take the time to think about what, what you would want. Maybe you have somebody to share. Anybody? I haven't thought about that at all. I know I'm I know it's gonna happen. Mm -hmm. Okay. Step one. But you say the medical care at the end of life. Do you mean Extending life, or there's a lot of different. If you think about um, different uh, different scenarios, you know, has anyone here ever been with somebody when they've been towards the end of life? Yeah. Yeah. Can you tell me about that? Uh, it was my mother, and we took her to the emergency room. The emergency room one day, and she never came home. You know, for six months, popping between the rehab center and the hospital. And she, I would ask her, "Do you want to go home?" And she did. And we made that happen by having a conference type discussion with the doctor sister and my mom present and she was happy to come home. She only lasted like three days after that because what I didn't know is that they take her off of all her medication when you make that decision. That was a huge surprise to me. I don't know why they would do that but that's what happened. So she came home and she just peacefully left the world. Do you have regrets about that? No, no. Because no. I gave her what she wanted. Yeah. Yeah, what you described there, the six months to the rehab, to the hospital, that revolving door. Mm -hmm. Once people start getting into that revolving door back and forth, there comes a point where you wonder, are, are, is the hospital helping them? You know, is there something, this is where I say some of these things are just out of our control. Right, and then one thing after another was going wrong, and her organs just stopped working, you know, then a new specialist was brought on, and on and on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I know it's funny. So um, you got her home? Yeah. You got her home where she wanted to be? Yeah. yeah. That's I'm, good. I'm very happy about it. That's good. Yeah. How about you? Well, my mom was different. She had Alzheimer's, so it was ah. like 
that communication on that end. Yeah. But it's got me thinking about something else. Like yes. How many times do you need to endure chemo? Like, do you want to keep to keep going on it? How many times? Because I know that's my life you are right now. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, and we're going to talk more about that. How do you make those decisions? Yeah, and that's a lot, is thinking about what your goals and values are. Yeah. I think so also they should tell you what, I'm sorry, I'm interrupted, no, that they should tell you the effect that's going to happen after they do a procedure before you have the procedure. Because I didn't realize, and I don't think she did either, that once she had this certain type of chemotherapy, that there was no going back. So it's like my sister who's a nurse and the doctor that prescribed that knew what was going on, but I did not. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that was the result. Mm -hmm. I mean, she didn't have a chance to get better. It's like they took away all of her ability to heal, or I can't think of the right word. But, yeah, but there was no going back. And I, I was making plans to, because we were just about to go on a trip back to her home in Wisconsin, mm -hmm. her original home, and that never came about because we didn't know this fact. Could have been easier. Though. Communication. Yeah. Yeah. And I've got I, you are asking all the right questions because I I've got a little framework here that I think will help when we get to a little bit. So if nobody here has thought about it, then I'm assuming nobody's discussed it with someone else. Some things that, um, when we think about this, you know, what medical care you want at the end of life, there is no right or wrong to that. These are very personal things. That's why, you know, we just discuss this. But there's no, and there's, as I said, there's no right or wrong. Some people, um, I'll give you an example. Uh, Randy's father, right now, he would say early on in his illness, uh, he'd be in the hospital and he'd say, what are we going home? Let's go home. And he's a 200-pound guy. Her mother is a little 90-year-old, 90-pound um, woman, and she knows that she can't, can't, she can't physically take care of him at home. And he's in this beautiful hospice right now, <coughs> getting wonderful care. And um, and he's not asking that anymore. And at first, the doctors were like, "Well, he says he wants to go home. He wants to go home. You should take him home." And I'm I was there helping them, and I said, "You know, I looked and said, no, he, he doesn't care.'" You know, he just needs you there. That's home. You know, he doesn't need to be physically in his home. So sometimes what, sometimes the reality is not always, is not always the perception. You know, the perception is not always the reality. So for him, being home um, was a priority at one point. He wanted to go home to get out of there. And then, not get out of the hospice, out of the hospital. But then moving into the hospice there, he's perfectly comfortable and he's got a lot and she's there by his side, and that's enough. So being at home is not for everybody. You know, sometimes people need more care, and it's not the right place. That's not where they're going to be comfortable. That's not where they're going to be. And for some people, that's all they want, is to be in their own surroundings and be at home. And both of those are perfectly reasonable. You know, we get that. So there's lots of, there's lots of challenges in discussing these issues. You know, you have to think about it, but you don't even know. What are you thinking about? What, what are the options? Really yes. I, I, so eight years ago, my, my my wife's mother passed away at home. She had advanced Parkinson's and made a lot of decisions about how she wanted and what she didn't want. And, and after she passed away, we all as a family, about eight of us, we all put down what our preferences were. So my father-in-law and the kids at all different ages had completely had forgotten we had done this. It was eight years ago. My wife just the other day came across all of the notes she took we had dinner and sat down and, and one I can't believe I didn't remember this but um, it is very fluid because my father-in-law who's now in his 70s what he had said in his mid-60s were actually sort of different you know they, they had changed and I can't believe some of the things we had said about what was important or not but it, it is challenging you know because I'm like oh my goodness like I wouldn't want someone else to hold us to things because they change over time and I just but it is interesting like, to have that conversation and then it opens up hopefully continuing to have the com a conversation because it is dynamic and what your goals are now may be different than what it is in a year or two years but but it's important to kind of share them and 
and then something we just realized that you know we were great. We had a great conversation eight years ago, but probably need to have a little more, and not isolated. But I just thought that was sort of interesting mm -hmm. how much they changed. I didn't introduce Jeremy. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Um, um, Jeremy, I'm, I'm uh, a physician as well. Um, I do pulmonary critical care, so um, I do care for patients when they're critically ill in the ICU, often going through these decisions in that time of stress or crisis, as opposed to sort of calm, relaxed, in a more comfortable manner. So there's many um, barriers why we don't think about this, and there's barriers on all parts. You know, as a patient, people are, uh, they don't want to know their prognosis. You know, there's fear, there's fear. What, is, what does the future hold? You don't know, you don't want to think about it. Um, some people have fear of death and dying, but actually most people, the big fear is that they'll be in pain. You know, if you ask people, are you afraid, you know, what, what if you have a list of what are the fears at that time, the number one will be fear of being in pain. So um, other things that you don't always think about is fear of disappointing a family. And this is what Randy talked about a lot, that Carlos always, he didn't want to let her down. Here she is, you know, 28 years old, and he's going to keep going and getting those treatments and doing everything because he didn't want to let her down. Um, and an odd thing that I never knew existed, but that Randy enlightened me to, is a fear of disappointing the care team. They were afraid of disappointing me. You know, oh, she's our doctor, she's doing the best she can, and, and they were, if we just say no. So all these things that you don't even know exist, these fears that are out there that um, people need to discuss. If somebody has, um, if you're thinking, if somebody's getting to a point where, I think it's like, if somebody's getting to a point where they're dying, um, And the goal is going to change. All of a sudden, you're not going to continue the chemo. You're not going to continue those medications. Right? She's going to go home and not get all the medications she's getting in the hospital. But there's a this sudden shift in this goal is scary. And uh, and people, it doesn't always have to be a sudden shift. It could be a gradual progression of a normal process. But it, it has to be planned out that way. Um, caregivers have fear too. You know, the caregivers, they want to protect the patient. They don't want to talk about this. They don't want to have this conversation because they want to protect the person who's going through this. They want them to know that they're there um, for them. And they want to protect themselves. You, know, you, don't want, you don't want your spouse to die. You don't want your mother to die. You don't want, you want to protect yourself. And then there are some cultural prohibitions too where people don't, um, they don't always tell people what they have. You know, big C. They don't say we're cancer. I, I, patients today that I see that they do, they ask me, don't use the word cancer. Don't use the word hospice. And that's fine. I'll work with whatever works for that family. But um, but that's a big that that can run into some problems. And then there's barriers as doctors. You know, a lot of doctors don't have the training for these conversations or for taking care of dying patients as much as they should. We get, in medical school. We get a lot of you know, we learn all of our biochemical pathways and all our antibiotics and all those things, but you don't always learn how to communicate with a patient and a family that's dying. Um, doctors will fear that the patient will give up hope, or the caregivers will think if you tell them they'll give up hope. And, you know, I always try to, when I do any teaching with residents or fellows at the hospital, I always try and um, reframe that. You have to just reframe what you're hoping for. You're not giving up hope. There's always hope. But what are you hoping for? And just make sure it's a reasonable thing that they're hoping for. I hope that I don't suffer. I hope that I'm not in pain. I hope that my you know, loved ones remember me. I hope that they know I love them. You know, all of these other hopes that people can have. Um, and, it, and you know, doctors don't learn that kind of conversation in medical school. There's the advanced directives, which we'll talk about. Um, doctors don't always know how these are applied. Uh, these check boxes, that's why I think the most important part is the conversation. It's not checking the box, because these, these boxes can be interpreted differently. So having exposure to that and knowing about that is not something that's covered in medical school. Um, people go into medical school to cure disease, to help people, to fix them. They don't go into medical school to learn how to help someone die. Uh, 
there is this whole field of medicine, palliative care, is becoming more prevalent. A lot of our hospitals, we're very lucky here in the, in the Chicago area to have many hospitals and many excellent programs in palliative care. So that can help with symptom management and can help people to, um, to manage this time in their lives. But that's not, not everybody has that. Um, some people have medical legal concerns. I don't, you know, with not giving therapy, I don't think that's, there's too many people uh, that run into that, but there may be some, if they're thinking about legal issues, if they're not offering a therapy, or if they're, if they're telling somebody that they don't have treatment for them, that's a concern. So that should happen. So, um, the other barrier for the healthcare time, and I hate this one, is lack of time. And I hate it because I think it's a cop-out. This is real. Uh, you know, I saw 15 patients in the office yesterday, each one gets 20 minutes, and that's not a lot of time to open up this conversation. It's a big conversation. And if you're gonna have this conversation with somebody about their end of life, you better be prepared to let them talk and to sit and listen and to engage in that. And that's where it can, it can run into a problem. But, so you need to carve out that time. You need to make that time. But that's what um, the medical system is not so good at doing. You know, I'm lucky where I am uh, at Northwestern. We do have the ability to carve out that time. But not everyone does. You know, medicine, to some extent, is a business. And you have to see patients in order to keep the office running and to be able to deliver the care you want. But, um, but this is too important to rush through. So, what happens because of this, because there are all these barriers, there's this big mismatch between what patient preferences are and the actual care they get. 70% of people say, if given the choice, they, they want to die at home. You know, they like to die in their own home, in their own setting, but actually 70% of people die in an institution, whether it's a nursing home, hospital, or a hospice. So that's, there are some people that need to be in an institution when they die. That true, um, but probably not 70%. So your mother was able to express that she wants to go home and they were able to make that happen, and that's what I'm learning. Oftentimes, um, that's not the case. So trying to get, trying to bring the patient preferences and the actual end of life together is a big missing piece in our medical system. It's getting better, I can tell you that. It's getting better. Um, and a lot of that is due to things that have been present in the news and stuff, in the books. Has anybody read the book Being Mortal? It was number one bestseller on the New York Times list for a long time. And it was written by a doctor and it talks about end of life. And it's an excellent book. Named the, the, the author is Atul Gawande. Um, it's called Being Mortal. And he's a doctor. And he talks about his father and other people, just this, experience, this US experience of end of life. And there's other, there's other times where this comes up. And I think this is being talked about more. Um, and these efforts are making a difference. So let me see if this is going to work. We have a little, let's, I don't know if this is going to work. No, speakers, I'm sorry. Yeah, not enough. All right, I'll tell you what's going on. So this is, this is a good clip. Um, and what happened, you know, you know Seinfeld, right? Jerry Seinfeld. And Kramer sees this movie where somebody dies and he says, I don't want that. So he writes up this goofy end of life thing about, you know, I don't want a lung blower and all this stuff. And then they take it to a lawyer and this lawyer goes through checklists. And the lawyer is Ben Stein and it's hysterical. And he goes through these checklists. If you have, if you have no liver and 
he threw a tube and he says, no, pull the plug. And they go through this whole thing. And the point is that this is not a checklist. You know, that's not what this conversation is about. Um, anyway, what is it about? It's about living well. You know, forget all these procedures and processes that go on in the hospital. We're talking about living well. So you think about what is living well to you. What are some of the things that you do that make your life truly meaningful? Share. Playing with all my grandkids. Grandkids. Getting yeah. to run around and play and enjoy. And, and give them all that grandmotherly it's, wisdom. At least. <laughs> <laughs> just getting out and being and living and having fun, dancing, uh, just enjoying. It. Yeah, good. And I know some of the medications you can't do that. Yeah, okay. So, so I've already. That's one thing I've been discussing with the doctors, too, because there's some medications they want me on, and my sister also has gone through this, and I saw what she was like, and I said, you know, not going there. So that takes us to our next one. What can you imagine living without? So your grandkids being active, running around. What if you can be with your grandkids, but you can't run around with them, but you can still be with them and enjoy them? And I would enjoy watching them, mm -hmm. hearing their laughter, and running around, but they're used to me interacting a whole lot with them. So. Movement, being active, mm -hmm. engaged, yeah. not passive. So these two questions. But it has slowed down. I will admit, it has slowed down and they're used to that. They know what I get. When I've been in the hospital and then when I the surgery and then I'm out and then in and out. So they're used to that. I mean, not used to it. It's, you know, they know how to act at those mm -hmm. times. I'm the one that gives them the signal. Okay, let's play. Let's get down on the ground. Let's yeah. wrestle. Let's whatever. But uh, I know the... A lot of the medication for the estrogen it just throws you for a loop. So I know it's supposed to help, but the percentages aren't as high. So you're weighing the risks and the benefits. What what are you gonna lose? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's important. It's like a matter of. Uh, Do I want to live longer, or do I want to live my life, kind of thing? And it's not about numbers. You know, people can give numbers and, and, you know, what are the percentages? What is this? What is that? But it's really, what are you going to be able to do? Are you going to be able to live your life the way you want to, the way it gives you meaning, when you find meaning? Um, are you going to be able to do those things? Yeah. And sometimes people, you know, people find meaning in all different things. They find meaning in interacting with their grandkids. They find meaning in attending their church. They find meaning in you know, getting out and taking a walk through you know, beautiful paths around here. There's different things that people find meaning in. And, uh, but really understanding for yourself. Understanding for yourself what gives you meaning. What are your own goals and values? And then um, understanding what fears or worries you have about medical care. You said you've seen your sister go through this. Right? And you've seen what you don't want. And really understanding what those fears are. Um, I had a patient who um, was being treated for rectal cancer, and she went through her chemo and her radiation, and she did great. And she had to have surgery, and she didn't want to have surgery. And um, and I was trying, and I finally I asked her, "What are you afraid of?" And she was afraid of having to go to a nursing home. She wasn't afraid of the surgery. She wasn't afraid of undergoing anesthesia, anything like that. She was afraid of going to a nursing home and being a burden on her kids. That was her fear. So she came in with her son, and we talked about this, and her son couldn't believe it. And she was, he said, no, you wouldn't be a burden. That would be fine. I'll bring the grandkids over to the nursing home. It'll be fine. And she ended up with surgery, and she ended up not needing to go to the nursing home. She went home. And, and, but without understanding what that fear was, we wouldn't have never gotten to that. So, and, I, and I asked her. It took me a while, but eventually I finally just looked at it and said, what? 
you know, what is it that you're afraid of? I didn't say it like that. But, um, but eventually we got to understand what her fear was and we were able to address it. But without thinking about what it is, you know, what fears are worse. Because people can have different fears. They can be afraid of undergoing an operation. They can be afraid of being a burden on their family. That's a big one. People are afraid of the financial aspect of it. You know, what's the cost going to be? And, and is this going to you know, put, put me and my family in debt? There's lots of um, different fears that people can have. And unless you actually ask or you think about it, what is the fear? Um, we may be addressing a lot of them. And then really understanding the other thing about living well, um, you understand what gives your life meaning, what you can't imagine. What's a, what is, where do you draw the line? You know, for some people maybe it's, if I don't recognize my family, like you said, your mother had Alzheimer's disease. You know, there might be something, if I can't feed myself, if I can't get up and get to the bathroom on my own. You know, there might be different things that people have um, that they can't imagine living without. The fears, we talked about what the different fears are. And then you have to think about who or what helps you in difficult times. When you're when you're going through a difficult time, is it your grandkids that help you get through it? Is it your spouse? Is it your church? Is it listening to opera? Is it, you know, what is it that brings you comfort and helps you in difficult times? And by understanding these four aspects, you can really <coughs> get a sense of what living well is to you. Because that's the first step, understanding what living well is. And then once you have an understanding of what living well is, what your goals are, and what's important to you, now you can think about discussing that with somebody and letting them know, this is what's important to me. If I can't do this, then I don't want to undergo all those treatments. You know, if, I can't, if I can't be in this place, then I don't, I don't want to be hospitalized. So really understanding what is important to you, and it's personal. No right or wrong. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so then, you're going to need to discuss this with somebody because there may come a time where you can't speak for yourself, where you may have to turn to someone that you trust to be your voice. That's your healthcare power of attorney. And it's so important that they understand what their role is in this. The healthcare power of attorney should be somebody that knows what your wishes are. So they have to know what's important to you, what are your values, what is important to you. They have to be able to act on your behalf. And that may sound simple, but it isn't always. You know, your loved one at the bedside may want to make decisions so that you can be around longer. Maybe this one last treatment is going to be the one. But if you have stated that you don't want to go undergo any more treatment, they have to be able to honor that. So it's got to be somebody who can really act on your behalf. It could be a person that can make decisions in times of stress. Right? I'm sure Jeremy could tell you about this. People seeing families in stress, in this stressful situation. There's got to be somebody who can step up and make these decisions. And they have to be relatively accessible. Do you have anything to No, I, I, you know, I do run into cases where people have assigned someone to make decisions, whether a, a healthcare power of attorney or um, sometimes people get on the paper, a surrogate, someone who, you know, speaks for them. And sometimes they haven't asked if that person really wants to or be comfortable in that role. And sometimes you think, like, oh, of course, the person will make the best choices for me, but they're they have to be willing to take on that responsibility. So it may not be the best person. It may be someone else who, who isn't cold or, or, or tugged in different directions. So that's an important thing to consider in terms of who to help designate to speak for you. Could it be two people instead of one, or that makes it tough. very difficult? If those people are on the same page, you know, it can be tough, but it can be done. Because I have some people will say, well, my family is going to decide. You get a family of the people together that you're trying to make a decision on. So. But I think the more often and more frequently you're able to express before that critical or a critical time what your values and preferences are, the more comfortable they'll be that, they, that everyone's heard your voice. So what happens often is that people have heard different things at different times or there's that unknown because there haven't been conversations and a lot of stuff comes into play as the family all thinks they know it what everyone wants. So all the more encouragement to just really be active in discussing what, what your values and preferences and, and, and stuff are. And, and so, because we often end up operating what I call the area of gray. Like it always seems the medical situation is one that no one 
thought of ahead of time, right? That you, you can't think of these things. And so you're asking people to make decisions that you really couldn't know ahead of time. But we can know your values and preferences. And we can try to, and that's our job as physicians, to sort of match the medical situation in your family to help us with what your values and preferences are and then mesh that together into the right choice for you. So there is, if you don't have a health care power of attorney, there is a health care surrogate act. And this is who is assigned. If you don't have this health care power of attorney that we'll talk about, then it, there is an order that um, people will be assigned to make decisions. And you'll see, you know, so if a, take, aside from a guardian, if somebody has a guardian, if they have a, an assigned guardian, that's, they, they're the person who's designated to make these decisions. But the second person is the spouse. And the spouse is not always the right person. You know, the, sometimes the spouse, I've seen a situation where the spouse is just too grief-stricken and too sad and too, and they just can't make these decisions. And maybe there's a child that is the right person. And, you know, maybe it's not the oldest child, maybe it's the second child, but there's, there's an order. And this only comes into play if you don't have the power of attorney or if there's, if there's disagreement, if there's disagreement. And that's where the, having the conversation will take care of a lot of this. Having, like Jeremy said, having these conversations with your family, with multiple family members, over multiple times, and letting them know what is important to you. Then those decisions go much easier. So what does this say? What are you asking the agent to do? This is a big job. It's not something to be taken lightly. You're, this person is going to have the power to accept or withdraw health care. So if you have a health care power of attorney, um, if something were to happen, like for Carlos, when he um, had his pulmonary embolism, and the paramedics came, and he got intubated, and they went to the hospital, and he was on a ventilator, we needed to make the decision to take him off. That it was t that it was appropriate time for him to go. And you know, she's 28 years old, and she's got his mother there, and you know, it was a very stressful situation. But um, but that is what the healthcare power of attorney, one of the decisions that they may have to make. Um, they're going to be the person to agree to admit or discharge somebody from the hospital or from, or into a nursing home. You know, we always hear people saying, I never want to go to a nursing home. Sometimes a nursing home might be the right place. And somebody might have to make that decision that, no, the nursing home will be the right place because that's where they will get the care they need. So these are the sorts of decisions that the healthcare, that will fall on the healthcare power of attorney. They will have access to the medical records. So you all know about HIPAA. Right? Every roadblock we put up to, to keep people's health care records private, um, this person would have access to the medical records. And then finally, they would carry out the plans for disposition, whether it's burial, or cremation, whatever that person would have wanted, they would be the person responsible for making sure that happens. Organ donation. Um, all of these decisions are things that should be discussed with your health care power of attorney. So then you just you know, you take the burden off them. If you give them all the answers to these questions, then um, all they have to do is carry it out. That's what you're asking them to do. So these are, um, these are this is the job of the healthcare power of attorney. So you know, you know, the kind of person that it should be and what you're asking them to do. And this is all outlined in that power of attorney that we're going to go over. So then we've got the medical treatments. You know, we talked about having to educate yourself. You identify your values and goals. Um, but you also have to educate yourself about what might happen. What sorts of decisions are we talking about? And there's a lot of them. We can't predict. That's why I think check boxes on these things are a bad idea. Because we can't predict what the, uh, what's going to happen at that time. So the one that a lot of people know about is CPR. Right? Cardiopulmonary resuscitation. Chest compressions, shocks, the whole thing. Seen in the movies. Right? And what happens in the movies? Somebody has this and then they you know, get up and they go home. It's not the reality. That's not usually what happens. Usually what happens is, um, well, we'll talk about that. I think I'll come to that later. If not, we'll come back. Uh, so that's what, that's the most urgent thing that occurs at the end of life. When somebody's heart stops, when they stop breathing, it's do we do CPR or not? And it depends on why this is happening. If somebody's heart stops because of some, you know, they're a young, healthy person running the marathon this weekend, right? You always hear about it. Somebody, somebody drops during the marathon, and perhaps it's somebody who has some arrhythmia, and they can be shocked, and they can, they can recover from that. If it's somebody who has an advanced cancer, 
that there we don't have more therapy for and they're getting sicker, perhaps necessitating is not the right thing. It's not going to make them better. So this is these are the sorts of things that you educate yourself about and you speak with your medical team about, whether it's the right thing for you or not. Personal decisions, no right or wrong. So here's this is the money page. A lot of what we were talking about before um, can be answered by thinking about these questions. Would undergoing whatever, CPR, help to meet your goals of living well? Once you've identified what living well means to you, then you can answer this question, would undergoing chemotherapy, would undergoing CPR, would undergoing whatever it is help to meet those goals and personal decisions? If that chemotherapy is going to cure your disease, maybe. If it's going to prolong your life, maybe. You know, it's all, it's personal decisions. You have to understand what living well means to you, what is important to you, and whether chemotherapy fits into that. That's what I do every day. And I, th and I use this. Um, when we talk about advanced directives, we're thinking, what undergoing CPR? What undergoing ventilation? Being on a breathing machine? Is that going to help to meet your goals of living well? Depends on whether you're going to recover from it. And those are the questions for the for your physician. What are the chances that I am going to get off this ventilator if I were to do this and go home and be able to run around with my grandkids? And if they and if they're telling you that chances are low, then you have to consider whether it's the right thing for you. What do you expect from whatever it is? This is like what you were saying. What's the expected outcome? If you get this drug. What do we expect to have happen? Are you going to cure it? Are you going to palliate it? Are you going to um, just get sick from it? So really asking what, what you expect, making sure it's clear that, um, that your expectations and the physician's expectations are the same. What's an unacceptable outcome? This is the one that people don't ask. So if you have a surgery and everything goes great, Wonderful. But what's the unacceptable outcome? What if you have a surgery and things don't go well and you end up more debilitated than when you started? There's a chance, and what's the chance of that? And what would be unacceptable? And again, personal decisions that you have to ask. You have to think to yourself, what 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 can I not move it out? When we think about CPR, um, the, it's a pretty traumatic thing to put your body through when somebody has CPR. And granted, the expectation is that it's going to save your life. But what's the unacceptable outcome? Sometimes people aren't getting enough oxygen to their brain for a long period of time, and they end up quite debilitated. So understanding what the pros and cons are of each of these procedures is important. And then back to the fears question. What are the fears? What are the concerns? Is the concern about your overall well-being? Is the concern about the burden on your family? Is the concern about this is, how much is this going to cost me? Anybody who's getting any sort of cancer therapy these days, you know, we've got a lot of new oral therapies. And everybody thinks, yeah, that's great. But oral therapies are incredibly expensive. You know, you don't have to go in and get IV chemo, and people think that's a great idea, which it is. However, the way the billing of it is, is that, you know, you might end up paying 20% copay on these pills, which is thousands of dollars. So that could be a financial burden, and that would be, and that's a fear that people have. So this, these questions can be very helpful to help you to um, complete your advanced directive, but also to help you in making your healthcare decisions throughout whatever healthcare issue you So here's some of the facts. So this is this is just about CPR, and um, this is important because there's a lot of unknowns about CPR. Fewer than one in five people who have CPR in the hospital leave the hospital um, after an average stay of two weeks. So these people are in the hospital for a reason. They have an illness but they also have access to expert CPR within minutes. Um, 
and that number that I could tell some people these numbers. I can tell people, you know, when I'm talking to them about chemotherapy, there's a 20% chance this is going to work. And one person will look at me like I have two heads, and another person will look at me like, yeah, bring it on. So everyone's different. But understanding what the issues are, educating yourself, um, and then it allows you to make those decisions for yourself. So now this brings us to advanced directives. So we've talked about living well, educating yourself, discussing it with, the, with your power of attorney, identifying your power of attorney. This is the last step, and that's completing an advanced directive. So an advanced directive is a legal document, and it goes into effect only when you can speak for yourself. You are always the person who is the decision maker about your own health care until the time when you can't communicate what your wishes are to the healthcare team. And that's where you rely on, you rely on your power of attorney and your advanced directive. Um, there's a lot of different types of advanced directives. Who here has heard of a living will? You heard of a living will? Yeah. So the living will is, is a statement saying whether or not you would want um, all measures to, uh, to keep you alive for as long as possible. Or if something were to occur, um, you would not want any invasive measures to keep you alive. And that's the extent of a living will, essentially. A durable power of attorney for healthcare um, is assigning the person that you trust to make your decisions for you. And I think that's more important than making a statement about quantity of life versus quality of life. I think it's more important to have somebody that you know, you trust, to make your decisions if you can't speak for yourself. Somebody that you've spoken with that knows what those decisions would be. Uh, we're going to go through the advanced directive that we provided. It's the power of attorney. Um, but there's a lot of other documents that can go into it. There's something called a DNR order, do not resuscitate order. That's now referred to as the POLST, which is down at the bottom of the list there. Physician, no, Practitioner's Orders for Life-Sustaining Therapy. And it's replaced the old DNR order. Um, and I have copies of that if anybody's interested. But this essentially states whether you would want to be resuscitated at the time of your death or not. You would want an attempt at resuscitation. That's the main part of it. There's other parts too. Um, other documents that you can include with your advanced directive are um, your wishes for organ or tissue donation. The, um, Do they take organs if you get cancer then? Yeah, so organs not so much, but they do take tissue. Um, and this is, the tissue can be cornea or skin for burn victims, um, bones for people who've had amputations or new bone grafts. So they, those are tissues. And if there is no infection or anything, they pretty much will take them. And this is where, um, you know, Randy had personal experience with this as well. When Carlos died, uh, they asked her about whether, um, whether he would want to donate his cornea. And Carlos, I knew because I saw it many times, had glasses that were about this thick. And Randy left, she's like, nobody wants his eyes. You know, we can't see. But they said, no, they do. And Carlos was a big nerd. Um, he was a big Star Wars nerd. Like he had, as an adult, had all the little Star Wars figurines. And, um, and he donated his cornea. And a year after he died, um, Randy got a letter. And she never spoke to anybody about this. Donated the cornea, and then she moved on. And she got a letter from this kid who received his cornea, and he wanted to thank her for this donation. And the first thing he did when he could see was watch Star Wars. Not knowing what a Star Wars nerd Congress was. And this, you know, that way, he'd never seen it. He'd heard it, he'd listened to it, he'd never been able to watch it. And that was something that brought this kid great joy. And um, she just felt that there was, you know, something bigger than her at work there. So this is a very, it's something that does help. It can help. But it's personal choice. You know, organ donation is a very personal choice and something that takes research for you to really understand just what you're setting up for. But there could be beautiful things happening. 
So these are advanced directives. There's a lot of them. There's the living will, which I actually don't recommend. Um, the living will really only goes into effect in case of a terminal illness. So if you were to undergo surgery and you weren't terminal, but you were under anesthesia, living will doesn't really apply. Are we getting, are we getting copies of all this? Right? Uh, the living will is available online. I don't have that one. I do have the power of attorney for health care, which has a living will embedded in it. Okay, and we'll go through that. That's the one that I gave you. I have copies of the five wishes, which I'll talk about briefly. And that pink one in the corner is the pulse, the physician's orders for life-sustaining therapy. It's now called practitioner orders because nurse practitioners can sign it as well. And it's, um, I do have copies of that one too. So I'll tell you what each of these are. But we're gonna go through the healthcare power of attorney first. So I gave you this. The first couple of pages are explain it. And they tell you, it tells you um, what the purpose is. And then it tells you the things that you want your healthcare agent to know. So it walks you through these questions. What is the most important to you in your life? How important is it to avoid pain and suffering? These are all um, important issues to discuss with the person that you're assigning as your power of attorney. Because these are the sorts of things that may come up towards the end of the day. The next page tells you the decisions that your agent can make, which we went through. Talking to the, to the health care providers about your, your condition. Seeing the medical records. All of these things. So it tells you right there, it lays out what are, what are you asking of this health care power of attorney. And then it gives you those tips about who would be a good health care power of attorney. They have to be 18, they have to know you well, you trust them to speak for you. And it could be anybody, it could be your best friend, it could be you know, somebody from your book club, it could be whoever you think is the right person. The next page talks about um, a lot of other issues. If your agent is unable to make decisions, there is a place to put secondary agents. If you don't choose a health care power of attorney, somebody gets assigned. And that was that list that I gave you. Um, if there's no one available, then I can tell you that what physicians will do will talk to the first person that they can have. You know, whoever, is, whoever knows that person and can give us some guidance, we're going to listen to them. So if there's no health care power of attorney, then you know, we are really reaching out to family members, neighbors, friends who may know that person and help us with some guidance. Um, and then we're going to talk about what you do, which this goes into what you do with the form once you have it. So we'll come back to that. So then when you get to the last two pages, it's the actual document. So you put in there your name and your address, so your identifying information. Put in the agent, the agent's address, and the agent's phone number. How do we contact them? And then, it, once again, it's outlining the things that your agent is going to be able to do. Then there's this funny statement. I authorize my agent to make decisions for me only when I cannot, or to make decisions for me starting now. So there's a lot of reasons why that statement is there. If somebody has, if somebody has dementia, they're starting to have to lose their memory, then you may say start big decisions starting now. <clears throat> if somebody, you know, I've had older people who can't hear so well on the phone and the doctor's calling and they are just saying just call my dog. You know, so perhaps there might be circumstances where you kind of want those medical decisions to be deferred to somebody else. And if you talk to them about it, then that's fine. Most people will say that they want decisions only when they can. The next statement on the next page is this, is this essentially a um, living will. So this is optional. You can choose one of these statements, or you can um, defer to your healthcare power of attorney. So what you're saying is that either the quality of my life is more important than the length of my life. If I'm unconscious, my attending physician believes that I'm not expected to get better, then I do not want treatment that's going to prolong my life. Or, staying alive is more important to me no matter how sick I am or how much I'm suffering, how much the cost is. I want all, I want my life to be prolonged to the greatest extent as possible. And there is no right or wrong here. Either of those are appropriate. These statements are very vague. 
right? They're not talking about CPR, they're not talking about any procedures, they're not talking about anything, and they're vague on purpose, because we don't know what's gonna happen. We don't know what decisions are gonna be made. So this, this gives guidance to the healthcare power of attorney and to the physicians as to what is important and what, what your goals are. Does anybody have any questions about that? Thoughts? Then you can put in certain limitations. You can put in that you want to be cremated. You can put in that you want to be Morgan donor. You can put in that you never want dialysis. You can put in whatever it is that's important to you. you know, don't talk to my sister who I haven't spoken to in 60 years. You can put in there whatever um, things that matter to you. And then you sign it and you date it. Then you have a witness. And that witness is not the power of attorney. It's not your physician. It can be somebody in the office. It can be your best friend. It can be your other child. It can be somebody else that's to witness. And all they're witnessing is that this is your signature. And then below that, you put in um, the alternates. You know, in case we can't get hold of somebody or in case that person is not able to make this decision. And that's it. With this filled out completely, with your name, a healthcare power of attorney and a witness. It's a legal document. It doesn't cost you anything, and it, um, it doesn't have to be notarized. Then what do you do with it? You give a copy to your healthcare provider. To your yeah, you bring a copy. You can bring it to your doctor's office and say, "Make me copies of this." They put one on their medical record. You give one to your healthcare agent. It's a good idea if you have multiple family members to share it with someone else. I always tell people to give one to a neighbor if their family's not nearby. You know, if the paramedics come to your house, you want that nosy neighbor poking out the window who says, oh, here's, this is who they want to make their decisions, call this person. Or you let people know where it is. You keep a copy of it. This is yours, you keep it. You keep your original. And you keep a copy of it in some place in the pink folder, on, in the bookcase, in the hall. You know, and you let people know where it is. If you go to the hospital for any reason, you bring a copy with you. Don't count on the doctors to be able to find it in the medical record. We try. The, um, oftentimes where people get their medical care may not be the closest hospital. So if, you, if, if it ends up that somebody calls 911, they're taking you to the closest hospital, and that might not be where your healthcare problem insurance is. So it's always a good idea to bring one form with you. So this is um, uh, this is important to know to make it accessible. You don't give it to your lawyer. You don't put it in a safety deposit box. You don't file it in the file cabinet under important papers. You have to have it somewhere where it's, where it's accessible. This is going to be used in case of emergency. So people are always thinking clearly. I always tell people, if you're, if you're going to give them out to a bunch of people, you take your original copy and you write their name on the back and the date so that if you change your mind, and I'm going to tell you how, what to do with that, if you change your mind, you get, make sure all those people have the updated copy. Um, this is not a mortgage. You can, you can tear it up at any time and redo it. This doesn't, it doesn't bind you to anything. If you change your mind, if your rents change, your values change, your medical condition changes, maybe you're the person who signed as your health care power of attorney, maybe you've changed your mind, maybe they've gotten some illness and they're not able to do it now, then you do another one. You just do, refill, you just fill out a new one. The one with the most recent date is going to be the legal one. So then you just make sure that all the people you handed it out to you know. I'm going to tell you briefly about these other ones that we have. So I have copies of the five wishes here, if anybody wants it. So the five wishes is a little different. Um, it does have a health care, it does have a power of attorney. Healthcare power of attorney is the last page, and it's very similar to what you saw. This is, a, this is somewhat of a universal document. This is, you saw this one is Illinois. Illinois Statutory Power of Attorney. 
These are state forms. This one is recognized in many states. Not all states, but, but many states. And it does have the healthcare power of attorney. The difference is it requires two witnesses on this form. This is designed um, to make other decisions, to help you think about other things that could come up at the end of life. It's not just your medical care, it's your emotional care, your spiritual care. It's, there's other issues that are addressed on here. And you can walk through this form and you can find out, and you can think about what sorts of things are important. For example, pain medication, um, a lot of people are afraid of being in pain at the end of life. And sometimes the amount of pain medication we give can make people confused or sleepy or drowsy and foggy. And people don't like that. And there are some people that would rather sustain a little bit of pain and be clear-headed and sharp than having total pain control and not being so clear-headed. And those are very, it's very different people. And both of those are right answers. But stating what is important to you. So there's a statement in here, you know, being pain-free is the most important thing to me. And you can, you can circle that. And that's what you do. You circle things, you cross things out, and it's really just giving somebody guidance as to what, um, what's important to you during this time. So the five wishes is a good document um, to really walk you through this conversation with someone. So you don't need both. And the more documents I have, the more confusing it can get. So um, what I usually recommend is that people use this as a guide for the conversation, but this form is what's going to be recognized by the paramedics and everybody. Granted, they'll recognize this one as well. So you can, you can do either. If you have both, just make sure they match. You know, but the things that you've stated are um, the same and the people that you've notified and things are the same. The other one is the post. If anyone's interested, this one is a medical order. This is not technically an advanced directive. An advanced directive is something that you're saying, this is what I would want if. The pulse is a doctor's order. And this is the pulse form. Yeah, I think this is the most recent. And there's three main parts to it. One is stating whether you would want to be resuscitated at the time of your death. So when you stop breathing, when your heart stops, do you want an attempt at resuscitation? And this is, a, this is a big statement. Some people uh, are very clear on what they want and don't want, and for a lot of people this frightens them to say that, because maybe they won't do things that could help them. This is recommended for people who have a terminal illness, people who are um, getting towards the end of their life. In addition, there are some people that are just have very clear views about what they want and don't want, and it would be appropriate for them too. But um, for the most part, this is, this is the form that the doctors will go through. And if anybody wants to take a look at it. The second part is the really tough part. This is about medical interventions. You talked about your mother going to the rehab to the hospital to you know, go in around and around. And there comes a time where maybe going into the ICU is not going to be helpful. It's going to be more traumatic. So maybe that's not the right place. And this medical intervention talks about what extent of medical intervention do you want to expose yourself to? Do you want full medical intervention where you're going to the intensive care unit, you're being put on a ventilator if it's appropriate, and all of those things? Do you want limited intervention where, yes, you go to the hospital, look at antibiotics, but you're not gonna go and have invasive procedures? Or do you want comfort care where you're being kept preferably at home and getting the pain medication and the pain control you need? without going back to the hospital again. And that's what I mean, that these are, these are things that really apply as somebody gets closer towards the end of life, or if somebody starts seeing that revolving door. You know, you go home, you go back to the hospital, you go to the rehab, you're back home again, and you're back, and, and that sort of thing. This last part applies to nutrition, probably one of the toughest conversations we have. In fact, is this the last one? Um, Nutrition is an important thing to consider um, for people with dementia. And I don't know if you, did you and your mother ever have issues pertaining to nutrition? Nutrition? No, we didn't. No. Um, <clears throat> as people age, um, they eat less, and every dying thing stops eating. 
dying thing stops eating, whether anything is dying is going to stop eating. But that's hard, you know? When nutrition is such an important part of what we do to make people better. You get sick, what, what happens? You bring chicken soup, right? When we eat something, you'll feel better. And seeing people not eating is very stressful for families. They always think if, they're, if they eat, they'll get stronger, they'll get better. How can they not eat? But um, there comes a point where people just don't have those four requirements. They don't need the nutrition. Or the nutrition is not going to make them better. I treat a lot of people with pancreas cancer. And if somebody has pancreas cancer and they, they come to a point where they're not eating, no amount of food is going to make that better. So it doesn't help, but it's a horror thing to see. So what would happen um, a while ago is that uh, people with dementia um, would go to nursing homes and they would frequently get a feeding tube for them because they stopped eating. And, um, and it was very quick to put a feeding tube in because it's a lot easier um, to feed through a feeding tube than to sit there and spoon feed somebody for an hour and a half, you know, when, if somebody's not eating. So um, feeding tubes can sometimes be uncomfortable, they, they can be invasive, they can be infected, they can cause problems, and that's not the enjoyment of sitting down and eating a meal. You know, ice cream is not the same through a feeding tube as it is when you're eating it. So, um, so people started realizing, the medical community started realizing maybe we're not helping people by putting these feeding tubes in and nourishing their body when, um, when it's not helping them to live better, to live well. So this is always a, a difficult thing. And there's some people, if, they, if you ask them, if, you, if somebody has early dementia and you have this conversation about feeding, if there comes a point where you're not eating, would you want a feeding tube to keep you alive? Um, a lot of people would say no, but if you don't have the opportunity to ask them that, there's a pretty good chance they'll get a feeding tube. So these are, these are the three issues that are addressed in this document. So they're big issues, and they're issues to have with your medical team, because it's going to depend on what your health issues are. So the healthcare power of attorney, I think, is the one that is the easiest one to use, the most effective one. Um, as long as it's accompanied by a conversation. None of this stuff is worth the piece of paper it's written on if there hasn't been a conversation. Like Jeremy said before, you can have healthcare power of attorney and they never had the conversation with someone so they don't know what to decide. But having the, but having the conversation completing a healthcare power of attorney is um, probably the best thing you can do to relieve the burden off your loved ones and to make sure you get the healthcare you want. Any questions? Issues? Um, yeah, I hear um, This is great to hear the whole presentation and all the documents. Um, are there people in roles where um, families can sit down so that it's sort of an objective third party person to walk through some of these questions? Mm -hmm. um, and who are those people in those roles? Um, and then my second question is um, the Post form these three medical interventions um, in Part B or do uh, yes part okay B. Um, for example if we wanted to kind of just get a more description of each one to make sure we understand okay this is exactly what this means you know are there places that we can kind of re review that you know just to have it sink in and know exactly okay, this is what we want and this is what we don't want. Um, yes and no. So in most hospitals and medical institutions, um, a lot of the chaplains will, will walk through this with somebody. Um, the social workers as well, there'll be a social worker who will do this. Um, we do through our organization, we do this. And we've come here and done it before where we've met with people and we go through this process. So there's a program called Respecting Choices. And Respecting Choices, is a program that was developed um, in, up at Gunderson Healthcare up in La Crosse, Wisconsin. And it's a facilitated conversation that takes somebody through this whole process of identifying your values and goals, understanding what the fears are, and then getting to the point of having a power of attorney or a post form. So yeah, we can help you do that if, if you'd like. Right. 
um, or the or as I said, there's chaplains, there's social workers um, who can do this. The pulse form has to be signed by the physician. So oftentimes there'll be somebody else who will sit who will, who can facilitate it for you, but they can't complete it. It's got to be signed by the physician. Any other advice? Um, yeah, I, you know, I I think these are great questions. I like to try to you know understand a little more. What are these? Yes. three options yeah. if you, you know we read it and it makes sense because we know what they are but it's hard I think if you haven't had a lot of interaction with the medical world but I think these are even the absence of having a direct conversation which I think is great reading this to them spur more conversation again with your family is good um, but uh, you, know, you, can, I mean, you can also if you call your own doctor ahead of time and let them know you want to go over this they might be able to schedule, like if they know that, that helps them be able to prepare for that time in the office to make the most use out of it instead of 20 minutes doing, asking questions that aren't really what's on your agenda. So even your own physician might be able to help you walk through this. Just let them know ahead of time what your agenda is so they can match their time with yours. Um, then they also may say they're not comfortable enough to walk you through it. That may be the case as well. With, out there that a lot of physicians sometimes aren't aren't comfortable with this. So about resuscitation. Mm -hmm. Is there a percentage that people actually are okay after being resuscitated? That was that seventeen percent. You know, when you say okay, what's yeah. the definition of okay? I so thought that was okay. CPR. So that was CPR, so that's resuscitation. Is what do you took what I'm thinking of resuscitation, like on the operating table, and you know. You, yeah. You know. So CPR, cardiopulmonary resuscitation, is chest compressions and shocks. Uh -huh. and a little bit of okay. Do you have? Know? Yeah. I mean, this is this is where it gets it, it's challenging. So, so the data in general about mm -hmm. these these resuscitation shock CPR are not are not good, but there is a range. Right, depends how healthy you are ahead of time, right? If you're a 40 year old marathoner and someone can get you very quickly, that's a lot better than being 85 and, and chronically ill. There's also evolving stuff of how can we help make that resuscitation better? How can we help improve the outcomes? And there's a lot of research on that. And, and how things are now versus how things five years from now may be a little bit different. And so, again, most important, and we talked a little bit about what's the most Know, we had to choose sort of what are the one or two things to take away from here. I think you know, DNRs and DNIs and CPR, those are good and important starting points. But way more important is just talking to those who can speak for you. Because because half the time, you may have a paper that says CPR, you may be in a situation where that paper is not available and it happens anyways. And, you know, they, they don't know. When in, you know, you're, you're in a grocery store or a supermarket or, or out there, and, you all of a sudden have an arrest, they don't know that you are a DNR. But what do you do afterwards? What do you do when, well, you are, your heart's beating and you're breathing, but you're on life support. Where do you go from there? And that's where knowing what your values and preferences are and people who know you best can then step in and make, make those difficult but important choices. So I think CPR, DNR, those are all great, but, but more often than not, actually, these papers don't count. They're not available. So conversation, conversation is really important. And understanding, and it depends, like you said, it depends on what your overall health is. You know, what, what your, some, how well you're going to survive it and what's going to happen afterwards. Yeah. Like I said, what, if somebody has advanced COPD and lung cancer and they go on a ventilator, chances are they're not going to have very meaningful life. We are available. Our number is on there. Contact information um, for questions, or and I think we'll be back here. Mm -hmm. So we can always set up any time to sit down and meet if anybody's interested. Mm -hmm. yeah. So these forms, they're all official. I mean, we literally signed them right now. They would be valid. Oh, okay. This one needs to be signed by a physician. Oh, yes. But I mean, and in terms of the, you yep. also need to be signed by a witness and all that. Because yeah, so 
doesn't need to be notarized, this is the official form. So you can complete the power of attorney and you know set up a time with the doctor to talk about the post or something. You know, the, all of these things can be, can be done. Question. What happens if you're out of town mm -hmm. and something happens and you end up in the hospital and your the power of attorney isn't around? The person that's with you haven't called them, or how would that work? I mean, this happens. I work at one of the hospitals. I work at a resurrection medical center. It's right by O'Hare. So anyone off the airplane comes straight to our hospital. So we have people from all over the country or out of the country end up, and we, you know, we do our best until we can contact anyone, right? We, you know, ID or whatnot. We reach out if there's no no one traveling with them. Eventually, you know, the more people who know who is the decision maker, the easier it is to reach them. But we ultimately, we, you know, go by the person who feels they can best speak well. There are some guidelines that we talk about, you know, in the absence of these papers, who the default is. But yeah, we're often desperately, you know, going to a neighbor or anyone that answers the phone, you know, uh, please can go looking for other family and so forth. But the more people who know, the more people have copies, uh, There are apps for this too. If you have, a, if you have like, there are. Um, this one I just learned about. It's called Smart 911, and this is uh, being rolled out in Chicago now. I think it's also exists in DuPage County, and um, and it's connected to the police. So Smart 911 is an app that if you call from your cell phone, you know how. Um, you used to call, when you would call from your landline, they, people could find you, right? They could find you easily from your landline. From a cell phone, they can't. And that's why a lot of people will keep landlines. That's why Randy to this day has a landline, because that's what she didn't have to think about giving directions or telling people where to go. It's just they call from the landline, they know where you are. From a cell phone, they don't. Cell towers ping all over the place. So, but through this smart, smart 911, if you call from your cell phone, that number is going to pull up a profile. And I put it on my phone. I haven't filled it out yet. I just learned about it last week. And it opens up a profile, and it'll have all your information in there, as much as you want. I think you can even scan an advanced directive in there. So if somebody calls, if you call 911 from your cell phone, um, they will know. You have to put an address in. They still can't tell where you are exactly. But if you're at home, they'll go to your home. They'll know where that is. They'll get that address immediately. And the cop I was talking to about this told me that she has her kids pictures in there. So if one of her kids goes missing or something, she calls 911, they have the picture immediately. So it's all sorts of information you can put in there. You can put in the list of medications. You can put in if somebody is at home, if somebody's at risk for domestic violence, if somebody is at home who has dementia. You know, there's all sorts of information you can put in there. It was really interesting. So, because that's one of the issues is, is people need to get this information. It has to be accessible. A lot of people say, isn't this online? Why don't these medical systems have all this, you know, in the electronic record have it accessible? And it, it, we're just not there. It will be someday. <laughs>